In 2009, around 25% of American high school students said they had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. By 2021, it was up to 44%, the highest level of teenage sadness ever recorded. For girls, that number was even higher, 57%. Now, what could account for such a dramatic change between 2009 and today? You know, what, what, would you, what would you see if you looked out and saw teenagers? What would look different? The main thing you'd see is the teens hunched over their smartphones. Now, these stats come from a recent episode of TGC's Recorded podcast, in which Sari Kofzalstra shares the stories of young women being shaped by social media. She talks to Gen Z about what they think, feel, and believe. Now, Sarah has also recently edited a book, Social Sanity in an Insta World, that brings biblical and theological perspective to bear on our social media use. Contributors include Melissa Kruger, Jen Wilkin, Ruth Jo Simons, and Laura Wiffler. Now, Sarah is senior writer for the Gospel Coalition and co-author of the book Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age, from which we also use the title of this podcast. And she lives with her husband and sons outside of Chicago. Sarah joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss influencers, fasting, and taking advice from strangers. All right, Sarah, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thanks for letting me come. What were you seeing, Sarah, that prompted you to edit this book? So embarrassingly, Colin, I wasn't seeing anything. Um, I was totally oblivious. Um, but I did go to the Gospel Coalition's women co Women's Conference in 2020, and I sat down happened to be at a table full of girls. And one of the girls who was sitting there was Laura Wiffler, who is a contributor to the book and who does Risen Motherhood. And she told me, Sarah, there's something going on with social media and you have to write a book about it because um, where she sits at Risen Motherhood, she can see a lot of young moms. And she was watching the way that they were interacting more and more with social media and also the ways that they were following and being discipled by social media in ways that were not the way that their local church would like. Um, and so she was seeing the effect of it from that demographic. Um, and so I said, how about you write a book, Laura, instead of me writing a book? And then um, we kind of decided, why don't we all write a book? And so the advantages of that are, A, it's a lot faster if everybody takes a chapter. And we knew if we were going to write about something like social media, it had to be fast. And then B, everyone can contribute from their area of strength. And so we asked women who are really strong in these different areas to address them. Do you remember, Sarah, the first time you got a smartphone or first joined Instagram? Do you recall how you felt in those times? Um, I, I never was very good at Instagram. Colin and I honestly never even figured out how to post something, but I do remember <laughs> um, getting on Facebook. That was sort of like our drug of choice, I think, for women who are my age. I am now 43 years old as of today. Um, and I, when I was first getting on, I fell a little bit into this gap of I was just out of college, maybe graduate school age, um, and so, and didn't have my first baby yet when, when Facebook first came out. So I fell in this little gap. So then when I did get on, it was 2007 um, and I had a one year old and was probably finally getting along around to like, what is all of this? And it really, for me in those first days was a way for me to, I was, I was alone at home with my babies and then I was homeschooling for about five years. And so it was quite isolating and it was a great way to, you know, have a cup of coffee and reach out in a couple minutes when they were playing or having a nap and I could feel like someone else was out there. Um, and so. I, I loved it. And also the other big advantage is if you are home with toddlers or if you are homeschooling, you have endless photo, photogenic opportunities to you. Um, so every day my kids were doing something cute or saying something cute or we were making a project or a craft that looked cute. And so it was kind of the perfect storm. That was, those were my heydays of social media use. You're, you're not still in your heyday? What changed? <laughs> I got older. <laughs> um, uh, I think really what happened, what, well, part of it is your, your kids get older, you get busier. And I also stepped into this weird place. And I wonder if anybody else can relate to this where I wasn't quite a private, a private person anymore. It was even before I was at TGC was sort of like when I was teaching, like, do you be friends with your students? You know, you start having relationships that you're like, I don't really know if I want you to see all the pictures of my kids and know my thoughts on this. I'm kind of just posting for my own friends and family. And now my circle is bigger and I started to feel uncomfortable. Like I didn't know what to do with it. So then I just became a lurker because I didn't know what to post. So I just, and then from lurker post. to 
well, eventually I quit <laughs> altogether. <laughs> well, what, I mean, what have you learned? Let's just say this. What have you learned from leaving social media? Yeah. Um, so I left social media in March and it was as part of doing the scrolling alone podcast, I came flat up against my own self that I couldn't recognize in the honest and vulnerable words of Gen Z girls, smart girls at Berkeley who loved the Lord, who are explaining to me why they, they knew social media was a problem and they were honestly explaining to me why they didn't leave. And it was things like the, I have pictures on there of myself that I like. Or, um, you know, that's kind of where, you know, how would I get all those followers back if I left? You know, those people are following me. And those, she he even said to me, like, I know these are superficial reasons, but and yet this is why I stay. And she was right. And that was why I was staying too. Um, and once I could see it, it's kind of in black and white, I was like, that's not a, that's not good. Um, and so I quit all of my social medias. Um, this is from my own personal experience since then. I have noticed improvements in probably four different areas. One of them is in my time. Your smartphone will tell you how much time you spend on social media, but it's really far more than that because you, you're you thinking as you go through your life, um, oh, could I take that picture? Could that go on social media? Oh, did my kid just say something? Was that cute enough that I could, how would I phrase that if I put that up on Instagram or, oh, um, I wonder if so-and-so posted something on Facebook yet yeah, about her trip. And then after you post something, you spend a long time thinking about the reactions people might have to it and going back to check reactions to it. Um, and you're also thinking about what other people posted. Oh, did Colin say that? Oh, did did Megan just, I wonder where she went? Or like you're just, oh, or I'll talk to my husband about like, hey, what do you think about this controversial thing? So it's, it's like running in the back of your mind constantly. So even though I didn't get, I wasn't checking that much, and so I didn't get that much actual stuff looking at it time back, I felt like I got hours back, just of brain time back, just of being able to pay attention to my life, which is the second big area where I noticed a difference is my ability to pay attention to my own life, my ability to be in, actually interested in conversations I'm having with my kids, my ability to read more pages at once before stopping to check social media, my ability to um, think through, oh, you know, what, what's going to happen in our schedule this next coming week? Or, how, you know, how do we, if we have an issue with our kid, how are we going to wrestle through that? And instead of escaping once things get hard, um, I'm just able to pay better attention and my brain can think through how to handle whatever's in front of me much better than I was able to before, which makes me less anxious, which is probably the third area of I'm less anxious about my own life. I'm less anxious about what other people are posting. Um, I just feel happier and more settled than I did before, um, which probably, which leads to the fourth thing, which is I feel like I have more energy than I have before. It's a little bit exhausting to constantly kind of be running that engine in the back of your head all the time, thinking about maintaining and creating and growing a whole virtual world in addition to your whole physical world. Wow. That was well organized. Thank you. I, <laughs> to, a, I wrote a, notes. It was a lot. Um, you did mention some of how this has changed you um, as a parent um, in being able to pay attention to those conversations. Other ways that it's changed you as a parent? I think the biggest thing is I'm not looking at them of like, oh, could I put what they just said on social media? Could I change that funny thing into some, you know, like... Not, I guess, and I don't think it's abusive or anything, but I'm not uh, looking at them and trying to form them into a social media meme um, or a cute saying or, or, you know, even something that honors them. If they win an award, I'm not trying to think about how I'm going to put it on social media. Um, Were you a big mom blog reader? I read some. Okay. I mean, this sounds like, you know, mom blogs predated social media um, and they've dramatically changed and diminished in a lot of ways because of social media. You know, for example, my kids, younger than yours, seven, four, and one, um, mom blogging, posting to social media is very different when your kids don't have a say in it than when they're teenage boys. Um, which probably should tell me something about what I, about my own practices now, but just sometimes living that public life 
Now, you and I are actually both public figures. I mean, we teach, we write books, we do podcasts and stuff like that. So we do have a public life to a certain extent. But for most of the people listening to this, they don't necessarily have those opportunities. But social media make all of us public in that sense. Um, I'm just wondering what we could learn from those mom bloggers because it's not necessarily gone well for them as the kids grew up. No, that's definitely true. Um, there's definitely oversharing and that has come. I mean, that's hard. If you can even just think about your own life, would you want your mom posting about all the things that you said and felt and funny things that you said the whole time you were growing up? I mean, there's a, there's a vulnerability to children that parents are, you know, ostensibly protecting as they can be safe with us and do dumb stuff with us and we won't tell the whole world about it yeah. except when we do yeah hmm all right i wasn't expecting conviction on this podcast, <laughs> but, uh, sorry what are the particular pitfalls for women on social media because it's interesting you didn't write you didn't record your podcast for about men and there are no male contributors to your book why focus on women yeah, I honestly think women's experience on social media is different. I mean, we do know studies show more women have a social media account. They spend more time there. They check more often. Um, but I think the bigger difference than that is the way they interact with it. So a woman on social media is there to connect. She's there to connect with friends and family. We know this because we did a Gospel Coalition survey where we asked 1,500 women um, of our own TGC women or a TGC adjacent women, people who come to our conferences and are on our email list, hey, why are you there? And 90% said to connect with friends and family. And I think for men, it's more transactional. They're maybe there to connect with each other, but probably not to build a friendship, maybe to make a professional connection, maybe to build a friendship, um, to engage with ideas, to argue about like different policies or thoughts on things. It's just a little bit more transactional than women who are looking for connection and relationship. Um, and so that's why, since the experience was so different, we felt like if we, we needed to tailor it to one gender or another. Hmm. Now, um, Laura Whiffler wrote something interesting in Social Sanity. She said this, when you spend time on social media, it changes how you shop, what you eat, who you vote for, where you give money, how you exercise, how you educate your kids, what books you read, and what you talk about at the dinner table. It affects how you run your business, how you make love to your husband, how you worship God, social media will shape what's important to you, what's worthy of your time, what you believe, and what you love. I know that quote stood out to both of us from the book. It seems a little over the top, but it's not. I'm just wondering, Sarah, is there anything else that's this pervasive or in our lives, or could we compare this to any other invention or technology from history? You know, I was thinking about this yesterday, and I know some people have compared even the internet to the printing press. And then one guy was like, not even that, it's more like language. Um, but I honestly think, like, even when you're saying those words, it doesn't sound like printing press or language. Colin, it sounds like Christianity. It sounds like religion is what it sounds, sounds like. sounds like religion. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing else that shapes your whole life, like religion and social More or media. less, it's, it's culture. And culture is historically an offshoot of Christianity, the notion of culture. It's got it, it, inescapably um, religious dimensions to it in its origins. And so very clearly social media is pervasively culture creating, shaping. It is an entire world that you can live in. And I, I thought the same thing. I mean, I don't know where you and I must have saw this saw the same thing about it's not like the printing press, it's like language itself. But as I was reading this quote, I thought, no, it this actually sounds like a religion. Because what else would the book, how you educate, what books you read, how you make love to your heart, I mean, all these things are dictated. I mean, I, I've been wondering a lot lately about the things that we think are a challenge to our faith are less important than the things that we often take for granted that make faith seem so implausible and impossible or unnecessary. And it makes me think that social media is one of those things that simply makes religion seem unnecessary or implausible because of the way it connects us to the transcendent notion of human connectivity 
or transcending our place, our time, our circumstances, our knowledge, the way it brings us out of ourselves to give us a sense that we, we can see everything, that we can understand everything. Um, but it's a mirage because it's, it, I mean, I'll, well, maybe I'm setting you up for this one, but like, why is it a mirage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I love everything you're saying. It, it makes it like Jen Wilkin writes about this in her chapter on identity and how social media makes us a promise a lot like the promise Eve heard, um, which was you can be like God. You can know everything. You can be friends with everyone. You can know, you know, you you can know what's happening in a totally different country or at a totally different time. And you can know that stuff basically instantaneously. Um, you can scroll through your news feed and see all everything that's happening. But of course, it doesn't we it's it's um it makes us anxious and this is kind of where it connects into we we see the same thing when we get this promise from the news industry you we will know everything that is happening all over the place immediately but that doesn't we're not built for that we're not limitless i can't work intimately in every situation across the globe for the good of the people who are there and for the glory of god only god does that um so i'm not meant to be, I'm limited, I'm purposefully limited. So when a limited being tries to be limitless, it makes that person anxious. Um, and that is what we see. Yeah. Oh man, like the way that we seek relevance turns us irrelevant. The way we seek to be limitless actually makes us captive to our circumstances. Oh man. Um, a few questions to push back a little bit on you. Shouldn't we aim to be influencers for the sake of Christ? Wouldn't that be a good way to shine our light, as Jesus tells us? Well, um, I don't think anyone should aim to be... Oh, I think we've got to dig into the, the words here a little bit. I don't think you should aim to be an influencer because you don't really want people to be like you. You are a fallen sinful human being and you know that if you think about yourself long enough even if your kid does something and you're just like oh gosh i think he gets that from me like you don't want to you're not really trying to make people into your own image hopefully um and if you thought about that for a few minutes you'd be like yeah you're right that's not you know i, I don't actually want the world to look exactly like me i think instead maybe the question is should we what we should be aiming to do is to use our influence wisely so if you already have a platform you already have an influence with people, um, then how do you use, then Then certainly the aim would be to use that wisely in a way that points to the Lord. But I don't think anybody should say, boy, I hope I can add more followers. That is a trap. Um, okay. Yeah, that's a trap you don't want to get into. So if you have a platform and you testify to Christ, that's one thing. If you try to build a platform so that you can testify to Christ, that has a different connotation. The trouble with trying to get people to share your stuff and like your stuff and follow you is that you start thinking necessarily, how can I get people to share my stuff and like my stuff and follow me? And then you think, well, what would they like to hear? And what could I put up that they would like and follow and share? And so now you're in a trap of, I'm not posting what I want to anymore. I'm posting what I hope you will like. Um, and that's quicksand. Not fundamentally different from the decisions politicians need to make or journalists need to make, but now with everyone being an influencer, just completely culturally pervasive. All right, I designed this question to trip you up. Um, Reformed theology extends to every square inch that the Creator God declares mine, to paraphrase our friend, long deceased friend Abraham Kuyper. Shouldn't you be engaging social media instead of leaving it? I 100% believe that Christians need to be on social media, engaging it and shining the light of Christ there. I also 100% believe that most Christians should not be there just because we are, you know, Jesus is Lord over every square inch doesn't mean that we, every single Christian change welding to the glory of God or change the post office to the glory of God or change Iquitos Peru for the glory of God. Like that's not, we don't all have to do all the things. And I think some people probably are specifically called and gifted for ministry on social media and sharing their light there. And I think most people are not. Not everyone should be teachers. Not everybody should be journalists. 
as you and I know full well, um, not everybody should run for office. So the broader principle of engagement does not necessarily um, bind all of us to do that in the same way. Okay, well. Do they pass? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, <laughs> you know, what's the Still most reformed. redemptive way you have seen social media be used? Yeah. I wish I had more of this. Um, I do, I know there are kids who have come to faith on TikTok. And I know there are women whose faith has been deepened by running across TGC articles or Desiring God. I know that people's faith has been challenged and deepened and connections have been made to really good gospel preaching churches. And I know this is not just in America, but across the whole globe. Um, I, I'm wondering a little bit about, um, like TGC, we, I've seen a lot in other countries the way that the internet has, God has used the internet to bring good theology to almost what we would call theology deserts, um, where they can run across a sermon from Tim Keller or, or John Piper and just be totally moved by that. And whole revivals can kind of spark from building off of a, a good and careful theology. I, I, nobody says to me like, oh, we found each other on Facebook, but maybe that's happening too. So I want to oh, like, there's, there's space for that as well. And I think there's also small things too, right? Like even taking a picture of something good and remembering that good moment or sharing that or um, learning something new, even if it's like, hey, I don't know how to make this thing for dinner or I don't know how to, you know, fix my lawnmower. I think there's th that thing too. Um, you know, we can learn those things. I guess that'd be more from a YouTube video. Well, that's what I was going to so. say. I mean, YouTube is a form of social media, but I think we need to be clear that not every platform is the same and the social media is not the same thing as the Internet. Um, so there can still be wonderful, amazing things on the internet, but it not be, but TikTok to have its particular challenges or benefits or Instagram to have its particular temptations, but also its particular benefits to it as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any scenario where we're going to withdraw in some massive level, massive scale from the internet, but you also have to consider is it a good thing that your, if your kids are just watching YouTube all day, like, do you know what they're watching on YouTube? Are they learning how, like one of our friends, learning how to build rockets and then going out in their backyard and doing that? Or are they watching stuff that has no tangible benefit outside of that medium? Yeah, there's a lot of content on YouTube that is going to be utterly baffling to an adult and maybe adults should be more attentive to <laughs> what's being watched and, uh, and try to encourage them toward um, healthier pursuits. We, we certainly would, would hope for that. So let's ask the hard parenting question here then. What's the right age for giving your child a smartphone? I love the way you stay away from controversial questions. Oh, just for you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I, this is this is an impo obviously an impossible question, um, but I do think there's a couple things you can think about. And the first thing I I want to say is just because your child has a smartphone, that doesn't mean that kid's cell phone needs to access the internet. Um, it doesn't mean that kid's cell phone needs to access uh, social media. And I know this because we we lock down Noah's phone pretty carefully. Um, and so phones can be great for a lot of things, but just remember, just because you got your kid a phone doesn't mean that's the, it's not a one time, Julie Lowe said this to me, uh, it's not a one time decision. It's a, it's a constant engagement. When you give your phone to your kid, that is the beginning of the decisions you will make about that child and that phone. You're starting a journey with them. It's not, it's not the end. So I think that's really important. I think also another good question to ask is not what is permissible, but what is best, right? What's the best use of my kid's time right now? What's the best for his brain development? Um, probably not blue light at night, probably not you know stuff that's spazzing around and uh, shortening his attention span. What's best for his social life? And I mean that seriously, not lazily. What's best for my kid's social life is other kids in my home. And so that's me saying, let's have some kids over or him when he says it and me saying like, yes, let's do it. Like what, what is the best? I want the best for him. And so what, what does that look like? Rarely does it look like, you know, goofing around on my phone. My guest on Gospel Bound this week has been 
Sarah Zalstra. You can check out the book that she's edited, new from the Gospel Coalition, Social Sanity in an Insta World. Also, check out the show notes. Um, we can get a link to this episode of TGC's recorded podcast. Um, just check out Sarah's amazing work there. You can also go back and check out our previous one, Escape from Kabul. Maybe, Sarah, we should give people a little bit of preview, a little preview of what you're working on now for future episodes of Recorded. So um, when we were working through this and seeing how this affected girls, you and I, Colin, could see that there's a little bit of a parallel for boys, and that is video games. Um, there's many things that run alongside. You cr you sort of create your own world in both of these. There are influencers in both of these. There's money to be made in both connectivity of these. Connectivity is a big um, goal. It looks mm -hmm. connectivity. Yep, exactly. It looks like an easy, fun life if you get good at this. Um, there's an empty promise in both of these. And, and so we're we're kind of driving down the road of opening up um, video games, boys, which opens us up then to a much larger question of uh, the statistics on boys in America are not them thriving. And so uh, how much does this play inside of here and what's, what's really going on with boys and how can we think in a healthy way about manhood and how do we help ourselves? Yeah, definitely exploring in their uh, universities that are, that are using programs to try to help connect people who love video games and to try to help disciple them into positive human interaction, stuff like that. So not entirely negative, but hopefully discerning <laughs> and hopefully uh, illuminating, especially to, uh, to parents who are looking for help on this or hopefully some, some gamers themselves and hopefully some, some women and men who uh, spend a lot of time on social media um, listening to this. So you can check out the recorded podcast. Go check out, uh, listen to Escape from Kabul. Check out um, her episode on uh, called Scrolling Alone. Wonderful episode. And then pick up Social Sanity and Insta World. Sarah, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thanks for having me. <laughs>